morning, everyone. As I mentioned last week, we'll be dedicating a portion of our Tuesday briefings to update you on school reopening plans. And Secretary French will share more on this in a few minutes. Additionally, Secretary Young has already briefed many of the media on the details of the budget that we'll be presenting to the legislature later on. As I've said many times, we're facing a once in a century crisis. And despite the challenges that have come with it, we put together a budget that's balanced with a combination of efficiencies, which we worked on for the last three and a half years, and state and federal revenues, but does not include new taxes or fees. Put more simply, just like families are doing, we're setting priorities, trying to do things smarter and better while making some difficult decisions. The bottom line is, we're not spending more than we're taking in, and we're living within our means. Building a budget in this environment has been easy, and I appreciate all the work by my cabinet and their teams this summer. It was a bit challenging to turn this around so quickly, but they were up for it. Again, as I said earlier, this budget does not raise new taxes. Because I don't believe this is a time to be asking for more from Vermonters especially when we consider we haven't yet felt the full magnitude of the pandemic, nor do we know the extent of the economic impacts. As well, we should not be cutting essential programs for Vermonters, and our budget won't do that either. And this budget does not tap into our rainy day or reserve funds. They're still full. We can do this because we've been focused on our fiscal management over the last four years. Some of you might remember this has been one area of significant debate with the legislature. In addition to our strong fiscal position, we're using our federal relief dollars wisely to help us manage through the crisis, help employers survive, and maintain the program serving the most vulnerable. This is the right time and the right way to use this funding because we need to provide for Vermonters now so that we can rebuild and recover faster and stronger. But we must also recognize that there will be more difficult budget decisions ahead. Even if we see a vaccine distributed after the new year, the next fiscal year that begins July of 2021 could be a much bigger challenge. In part because of the one-time nature of the support from Washington but also because of the unknowns we face in our economy and with the virus. But what we do know is the better we fight this virus now, the better the future will be for all of us. That's what we mean when we say be smart, stay safe, stay open. Slowing the spread allows us to keep businesses open and keep Vermonters employed and generate the economic activity we need. So let's continue the good work and stay focused. Wear a mask when you can't stay physically separated. Wash your hands a lot. Stay home if you're sick and follow the state's travel guidance. Switching gears, let's talk about school reopening, which will happen just three weeks from today. As we get closer to September 8th, I realize many educators, school staff, parents, and kids are nervous. Believe me, I get it. We all want to do what's right for educators, staff, and especially our kids. Having more than 50 school districts, each doing their best to craft a plan to meet the needs of their students and communities, and doing the work that is necessary to be able to switch between in-person and remote learning makes this especially difficult. So I think it's important to reiterate the answers to the following questions. Do we know if it's safe to return for in-person learning? Do we know how to implement health and safety protocols? And finally, why should we return for in-person instruction? First, prioritizing in-person learning is something we've talked about a lot over the last few weeks. It has the full support of Dr. Levine, the Department of Health, and other experts outside my administration. Dr. Bell and Dr. Raska, for example, have shared their professional opinions with us at these briefings. 
which shows we listen to the science and data from the experts and will continue to do so. Secretary French has been working with many others on the how. How to implement health and safety protocols in schools so we keep viral suppression high. The question of if, if it's safe to return to in-person learning has been studied, debated, and answered by Dr. Levine and his team at the Department of Health and supported by health professionals. The bottom line is we wouldn't be moving forward with reopening schools without their okay. Next is the how. How do we implement health guidance? Vermont has a 200-year-old tradition of local school boards. It's a tradition that gives parents a lot of input into their schools and their children's education. While it's appropriate to come up with guidance at state level, it needs to be put in place at the local level. There are more than 50 superintendents, 300 principals, and around 18,000 teachers, administrators, and staff who have more insight into the operations of their schools and the needs of the children in their communities than folks do in Montpelier. We need to lean on their expertise, like we do with our health professionals, to do this work because they're capable and they're on the front lines. Clearly, there will be obstacles ahead, like staffing levels, which may limit much in-person instruction uh, that districts can offer. As well, some districts might not be able to uh, go fully remote, and, uh, even though they might prefer it. And for many parents, childcare will be a challenge when we move back and forth between in-person and remote learning. In the upcoming uh, legislative session, we'll be offering some solutions to the first two issues. But today, we'd like to share our plans to help address childcare. Secretary Smith will provide more information next, but here is the overview. We know we need more child care capacity, and we need it quickly. Through an executive order, I'll be modifying our state regulations so that home-based providers can be reimbursed for more than four hours of care on school days. We believe this will add about 3,000 spots to help parents who are navigating different school schedules for in-person learning. Additionally, we'll be developing regional child care hubs for the school-aged children on remote learning days. These sites will, be, will use appropriate business and municipal spaces and will operate like summer camps from a regulatory standpoint to avoid some of the red tape so we can get them up and running quickly. We're recommending $12 million of federal relief dollars to be used on this initiative. And finally, I want to go back to the question of why. Why are we reopening schools? Why are we expanding childcare? Kids will have been away from school for more than five months when they return in September. We don't know the full impact, but what we do know is not all families have been able to manage this since March which means the inequity that existed before schools closed has likely gotten worse. We've heard from pediatricians who have told us that kids, especially the most vulnerable, are not okay. So, if the health experts are telling us it's safe, then we need to get back into some routine and provide stability for these kids. Because while we know there is some risk going back, there will also be long-term consequences if we don't. With that, I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith to talk about child care. Thank you, Governor. The Agency of Human Services recognizes that the multiple return to school models being pursued throughout the state creates a significant need for school-age child care on remote learning days. The Department of Children and Families conducted an analysis of the Agency of Education's enrollment data by county and grade and concluded 
that if 25% of K-6 students require child care during remote learning days, that is the equivalent to 10,300 new child care slots. So the Department for Children and Families will be working with community partners to get these new child care slots open and available in the next month. The governor's executive order will allow the Agency of Human Services to work with child care providers and expand capacity to meet the school age need with a three-pronged approach. These approaches include, first, as the governor mentioned, we will expand the number of slots available through registered family child care homes by eliminating the restriction that prevents them from providing more than four hours of care per day for school-aged children. This change will allow registered family child care homes to serve up to four school-aged children during remote learning which is currently what happens on school days. It is anticipated this change alone will service more than 3,000 children. Second, the Department of Children and Families will support the development of what we call child care hubs for school-aged children across the state. These hubs will be set up in workplaces, the school buildings, recreational buildings, municipal buildings, and summer camp buildings that historically care for children. We are approaching pursuing these multiple hubs throughout Vermont to allow for an individual approach to care and, and provide the needs in alignment with the supervisor, supervisory union's reopening plans. This will allow site flexibility to meet the care needs of the region and families. Grants will be available to programs running a hub site. Grant awards are intended to cover their initial startup and operational costs. These, uh, it is an anticipated and estimated that the regional hubs could serve as many as 7,000 school-aged children. Finally, it's important to build the capacity of the child care system. As we look to increase options quickly, the Department of Children and Families will expedite administrative processing and increase, and increase administrative flexibility for applications seeking to become a regulated child care program. Increased administrative flexibility includes granting provisional licensure to programs while they pursue full licensure, granting variances to licensing regulations, and expedited division reviews. We believe these administrative changes will add to the long-term capacity of the existing system of care. We understand that these changes need to happen quickly and child care providers will need financial support to increase caseload in current child care homes and to the develop the community hubs. Accordingly, uh, DCF plans to invest roughly $12 million to meet this need and to do it in an expedited manner. The breakout of the investments is as follows. The CCFAP CC uh, caseload increase, about $4.8 million. The regional hub site grants, about $7 million. And then a community lead grant to help us put this all together with community partners, about 220000 just under $12 million. I do want to point out that um, the hubs will adhere to health and safety requirements through the grant agreements. Sites will need to be, meet both COVID health guidance as well as child care health and safety requirements, such as ensuring all staff have background, background checks, with the goal of providing safe and consistent care for children. Other typical regula regulations, such as uh, the requirement of staff to have individual professional learning plans, will not be expected by grantees. We expect to have more information on this in the coming days, and Vermonters will be able to find information on DCF's website shortly. 
Uh, when we get it up, we will make the announcement on the additional information to DCF's website at dcf.vermont.gov uh, forward slash childcare forward slash parents. And now I'd like to introduce Secretary Dan French. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Uh, good morning. I'm pleased to be able to provide an update on the work of reopening our schools. Uh, last week, we reached out to our districts to understand the patterns in their reopening plans. As expected, a majority are implementing some aspect of hybrid learning, where students are engaged in both in-person and remote learning at the same time, or different groups of students are doing so. We have approximately 60 school districts in the state. We were able to obtain information on the plans of 49 of these districts as of last Friday. Of these 49 districts, uh, 46 will have some version of hybrid learning. Three will be remote. Uh, several districts are in the process of finalizing their plans this week. Hybrid learning is taking several forms. 75% uh, of these districts that responded are having two days a week in person and three days remote learning. 20% are having four days of in-person and one day of remote learning. We will continue to monitor these plans as we get closer to the reopening of school, and we'll be collecting monthly data on the implementation of hybrid learning so we can understand the patterns of access and opportunity. The focus of districts in the Agency of Education is now on the how of reopening our schools. We are interested in maintaining stability in our state-level guidance as much as possible. Last week, we issued an update to our health guidance. I do not expect to make any further changes to this guidance prior to the reopening of schools unless new health information or a change in health conditions warrants it. We are focused on producing guidance on applied aspects of the health guidance to specific instructional situations. For example, last week we issued guidance on sports and guidance on social emotional supports for students. This week, we expect to publish guidance for our pre-K programs. We are also working with our partners at the Department of Health on building out a robust list of responses to frequently asked questions regarding the implementation of our health guidance. As evident in the focus on hybrid learning in our reopening plans, we continue to build out our capacity for remote learning statewide, even with our focus on in-person instruction for younger students in grades pre-K through five. Our state level efforts to improve remote learning for all students include expanding access to the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative. As of August 1st, we anticipate about 25,000 Vermont students will enroll in the VTVLC course this year. We also formed the first state ever, uh, first ever state level instance of Edmodo, a popular education network site for teachers. Edmodo announced last week that they have reached an agreement to embed Zoom video conferencing into their platform. We will be following up with uh, Edmodo this week to explore bringing free Zoom access to all Vermont districts as part of their participation in the Edmodo platform. Another technology tool we are exploring is a statewide app for the implementation of the required daily health checks in schools. We hope to identify a technology solution this week. All the technology investments for the support of our districts in this emergency are being funded by federal dollars. The financial aspects of reopening schools are an important consideration since schools have had to make adjustments to how not only how they teach but also how they address the safety considerations of their buildings. <clears throat> I thought I would provide an update on the funding for reopening our schools which largely comes from the CARES Act. The CARES Act has three pots of money for K-12 education. The Coronavirus Relief Fund or CRF, the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Funds or ESSER, and the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funds, or GEAR. The General Assembly appropriated $50 million for K-12 education reopening costs under the CRF. These funds were allocated under specific programs, and each program must get separate approval by our Fiscal Oversight Group to ensure the funds are used in a manner consistent with the CARES Act. The Summer Food Service Program, totaling $12 million for the delivery of meals June to August, the application for those funds went out to districts in late July. 
the applications are now closed, and we had 31 summer food service programs request a total of $1.3 million of reimbursement from the CRF fund. The HVAC program with Efficiency Vermont, a totaling $6.5 million, was finalized last week. We are now working with Efficiency Vermont to get those grants out to school districts. Efficiency Vermont will handle the grant applications and then the reimbursements will be sent to the Agency of Education. The largest CRF program to schools, the General District Reimbursement Program of $29 million, was recently approved. The application will be going out to districts this week. Districts will be able to access CRF funds to cover COVID-19 related expenses that occurred from last March and going forward to this December. Second pot of funds, ESSER, the Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief, is about $30 million, and those funds are awarded directly to school districts as per the CARES Act, and can be used more flexibly than the CRF funds. For example, we learned last week that ESSER funds can be used to cover teacher child care costs. ESSER funds can also be used over a longer time frame through the end of September 2022. The ESSER application has been available to school districts in July. Uh, the Joint Fiscal Committee gave approval to this program last week. We've been working with them to identify solutions to the shortfall of the education fund, including exploring to what extent CRF and ESSER funds could be used to address the shortfall in the education fund. We will continue these conversations with the legislature in the coming weeks. The third pot of CARES Act money are GEAR funds, or the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funds, which total about $4 million in Vermont. The governor has decided to direct the use of these funds to support career and technical education centers. The GEAR application will go out to CTE centers in September. These funds, too, can also be used through September 2022. In summary, federal CARES Act dollars are being rolled out to districts, albeit more slowly than originally anticipated. I would like to thank the finance team at the Agency of Education for working rapidly to stand up these new complex programs. Current federal funding seems to be sufficient to address the immediate reopening needs of our schools, but the larger long-term costs have yet to be identified and no doubt will require additional federal help. That concludes my update on the reopening work. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Commissioner Levine. Good morning. We'll begin with a health update. Over the weekend, we reached 1,530 total cases in Vermont. The number of deaths remains, fortunately, quite static at 58. If we look over the last four days, we've had new case numbers that range from lows of three to highs of 17. Similar pattern to what we've been experiencing all along. While a number of the cases were in Chittenden County, they do not all seem to be connected to UVM students returning, nor to any discrete outbreaks, nor are they epidemiologically connected individuals. For the last week, Vermont was indeed noted for being the state with both the lowest number of new cases per 100,000 eight as compared with the national average of 112 and the lowest percent positivity rate which remains as you can see well below one percent 62.4 percent of our new cases come from three counties Chittenden, Rutland and Bennington. Now moving on from the data a few items on the testing front. First of all, we've discussed serology testing many times at these conferences and the idea of seroprevalence studies. These studies assess what proportion of the population has come in contact with the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. There's a large-scale study under the auspices of the CDC that involves several states and metropolitan areas. Results are still pending from this. There's also a study of blood donors. That is not yet uh, past its early stages. What data we do have comes from commercial labs. 
And these show a range between 1 and 7 percent prevalence. Admittedly, not very high numbers. Second thing on testing I want to discuss is that the, re the FDA recently authorized the Yale Saliva Direct COVID-19 Diagnostic Test. Of great appeal of this saliva test is the fact that it doesn't require any additional or sophisticated collection devices or swabs even, just a specimen cup. And it does not require separate nucleic acid extraction, which is, of course, the step that's done in the laboratory. And that's quite a benefit in case reagents become in short supply for the various laboratory platforms we use. What we don't yet have an appreciation of is what are the performance characteristics of this test in terms of its sensitivity and its specificity, and what settings is it most appropriately used in. I've tasked my public health laboratory team with exploring this mode of testing further and seeing if it should become part of Vermont's armamentarium. Finally, to provide some thoughts on college and school reopening. I'm sure by now everyone has seen yesterday's big news regarding the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a place that normally has somewhere in the range of 30,000 undergraduates. It had 130 students test positive in the first week. The school recorded a positivity rate of 13.6% out of the almost 1,000 students that were tested. And they also had five employees who tested positive. The state percent positivity rate at this time is in the 7% range. Now keep in mind that unlike Vermont, they were not testing students upon arrival at campus. Currently, there are 177 students isolated and 349 quarantined on and off the UNC campus. And they have now abruptly and fully transitioned to remote learning. To now segue to our experience in Vermont thus far, where students admittedly are still in the process of returning, we have had four students test positive at Norwich, one at VTC, and six at UVM. Once again, I'd like to reiterate what I said last week, though. While we understand hearing about new cases of COVID-19 is cause for concern, these positive tests mean the system is working. We actually want to find these cases as the campus begins to regroup so we know who needs to stay inside and away from other people so we can prevent the virus from spreading any further. The combined early testing and quarantine protocols that all of the colleges in Vermont have put into place will enable them all to protect the health and safety of their students, staff, and community as the fall semester gets underway. Regarding pre-K, through 12, I'll just merely echo what the governor said. The trends we've been seeing in our state for some time now continue to tell us that it's the right time to bring our children back to school in the carefully considered, measured, and safe way that we've laid out together with education leaders, pediatricians, infectious disease experts, administrators, school districts, and public health experts. Of course we know there are risks, and we hear and understand the fears and anxieties of parents, teachers, and staff. Had we this, the experience of so many other states, we would very likely advise a fully remote school year. But the data continues to support our conclusions to date here in Vermont. The younger children are less likely to transmit the virus, become infected, or develop severe disease that adults in a family are more likely to be the index case in an affected family, not the child, and that studies from around the world have not shown significant transmission of COVID-19 within schools. 
And as I've said many times before, we will continue to see new cases, clusters, or even limited outbreaks in our communities. But the public health protocols we have been employing over the past many months, testing, contact tracing, interviewing, and advising people who have been in close contact with a person who has COVID, really work and will continue to work to limit the spread of the virus. With that, we'll open it up for questions. Okay, we'll start in the room. Just want to remind everybody on the line and, and here that uh, we have a lot of uh, members of the media to get through and a hard stop at one. Calvin. Uh, thank you. So, Governor, I know the exact details of your budget are embargoed until 1 o'clock today, um, but I'm just wondering kind of as a general, um, is there is there anything that you know you weren't able to fit in the budget that, that you would have hurt, sort of reflecting on it, you know, anything that, yeah, that you wanted to put it in can? Yeah. Uh, we fulfilled most of the needs, um, obviously. Um, we have, you know, if we could, if we had unlimited sources of money, uh, we'd be doing more with broadband. We'd be doing more with all kinds of infrastructure improvements and so forth and, and uh, doing more of everything. Uh, but the uh, reality is this is what we go through every budget cycle. So I was um, pleasantly uh, pleased with, uh, with where we're at. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, surplus revenues as uh, we talked about last week in, uh, in the last year's budget. So we were able to utilize some of that uh, to fill the need. Uh, as well with our discipline approach and, and asking our cabinet members to, uh, to restrict and uh, find efficiencies, we were able to produce a budget that I think uh, is solid uh, and, and is able to fulfill the needs of Vermont uh, while taking care of the most vulnerable and, and really forecasting uh, what we need to do. So this could all change uh, as well. We, you know, what happens in Washington will have an effect on this budget. Um, if they come back into session and they were to uh, uh, distribute more money to the states or uh, allow us for more flexibility, our whole budget could change uh, dramatically as a result. But again, this is, we have to deal with reality and this is what we, we're going to present to the legislature. Ross. Thank you, Governor. Curious, looking ahead, we're only about a month away from one of the state's most popular tourism seasons in fall, especially with many out-of-staters and uh, typically Canadians coming across the border for foliage season. Obviously, we probably won't be expecting the Canadian tours for a little while, but curious if the state is doing any extra thinking, looking ahead towards what's traditionally one, one of the busiest times for tourism and interstate travel. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be, I think, limited in many ways. I mean, I think that people are, um, are a little hesitant to, to travel, uh, understandably. Uh, we put restrictions on out-of-state travel uh, in some of the communities uh, that are in the red and they're seeing uh, high cases of growth. So we're, uh, you know, we're at the we're at the mercy of the virus uh, here. So we'll have to uh, see what happens. A lot can change in a month. Uh, we'll maintain the modeling and uh, see where it takes us. But uh, we're not doing anything additional in some respects uh, because we just don't know. Uh, there's just uh, too many questions. But uh, if uh, things again uh, open up, everything is safe here in Vermont and our, we maintain our low positivity rates and, and throughout the Northeast region, uh, then maybe we'll see some more traveling in the state, which we desperately need in some respects. Thank you. Steve? Uh, to follow up on that, Governor, have you talked to anybody uh, in the, uh, either with the federal government or the Canadians as far as any ideas on when the but is going to open up because obviously with fall coming yeah um, and no I mean we're uh, we don't know any more than anyone else does at this point I'm not sure that they know uh, for sure I think a lot of it is re reliant on the Canadians actually more than in the US uh, in some respects uh, they've done fairly well in Quebec I watch their numbers uh, every single week and they uh, they've reduced their numbers uh, dramatically so I think they're a concern not for Vermont uh, but maybe for other regions of the of the country coming in and reinfecting uh, their their country so we'll have to see how we're doing and again there's some good news out there uh, I've watched uh, the numbers of some of the individual states and it appears some of the Sun, sun Belt uh, Florida in particular uh, their, their number of cases has been reduced uh, over the last week or so. That's good news. Uh, and uh, we're seeing the same in Arizona. So if that trend continues, 
Um, maybe we'll get a handle on this, but um, but again, we're all at the mercy of the virus. Okay, we're gonna move to the phones now. Lisa, the AP. Thank you. Um, this may be a question for Mike Smith. Uh, those regional child care hubs, how many do you anticipate the state needing and are they, those grants, are they state grants or federal money that will be covering the expense? Thanks, Lisa, for the question. Mike Smith here. Um, we're anticipating 73 will be needed, um, and we're using the coronavirus relief fund um, monies out of that in order to fund these. Okay. And how will parents sign their children up for those? Is this will be like a first come, first serve type of thing? Yeah, we haven't. We're putting together those um, aspects of those particulars of the program now, but. I would assume that they're going to fill up fairly fast, so as soon as we can get some yep. information out there, we will. Okay, thank you. Kat, WCAX. My question is also probably for Mike Smith, um, but it's actually about long-term care facilities. When will families who have loved ones in long-term care facilities be able to have physical contact with their loved ones? When I look through the state guidance for reopening those facilities, there are guidelines for when things like outside services can begin again at those facilities, but no guidelines for when a spouse or child will be able to do something like hold their loved one's hands. What do you need to see for that to be able to happen again? To be honest, Kat, I mean, I think we're going to need to see a vaccine. Um, the, the aspect of the most vulnerable uh, are those that are in an age group that are uh, uh, that are over uh, over 65, and I think what we're trying to do is make sure that they can lead lead a uh, normal life with the various stages that we have set up, the various phases that we set up. As you mentioned, you know, leaving the facility or having congregate dining, um, but the the I, the the sort of the protocols of this virus, uh, six feet of separation, masks, those sort of things, are really going to limit sort of the activities that you are describing until we can um, have a vaccine. I heard from a family who said, you know, it's kind of frustrating to see that um, someone can come in and, and do hair or do nails or something at a long-term care facility and have that physical contact with their loved ones and yet you know the husband of you know 60 years 50 years can't go and have breakfast with his wife so i think families kind of want to know you know given that many of their loved ones don't have unlimited time when will the state prioritize them having that meaningful physical contact i i understand and um, let me uh, go back and review with the group, but at the same time, um, we want many in our facilities, not only the person, you know, in the facilities that we're talking about, the long-term care facility, it's, it's not only the individual that we need to protect, it's the entire facility that we need to protect. And a lot of these guidelines are in protection, not only of the individual, but the entire facility. And as, as uh, you know, we try to make sure that we, as quickly as possible, loosen up these requirements. We got also got to make sure that we don't have the situation that happened in other states, where long-term uh, long-term care facilities were just devastated throughout the state. Thank you. Okay, Kat. Greg, the County Courier. Good morning, Governor. Uh, forgive me if uh, I didn't hear I had a bad connection talking about uh, education funding. Uh, um, this morning during a conference call, uh, I asked about the Ed Fund, and the quick response was that it's roughly $180 million short. Uh, what are you looking to do uh, with the legislature they reconvene next week to uh, try to reduce some sort of sudden increase in property taxes to uh, 
uh, under the end fund. Yeah. I, um, Governor, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Mr. Secretary, uh, Governor. Um, I would just um, point out that the $180 million shortfall is in the general fund, and I believe we mentioned $60 million in the education fund. Yeah, that's what I was just going to point that out, that I, I don't believe there's a $60 million gap in the Ed Fund uh, at this point in time. Uh, we, we think we're going to progress. We'll have conversations with the legislature about this. Uh, obviously, we don't want to impact uh, our property tax uh, rate payers at this point. We want to uh, just work our way through this. But uh, we think we can mitigate this, uh, but it really depends. You know, as I said earlier, we're at the mercy of the virus and uh, how long term this will be. And, uh, and how the uh, reopening goes. Do you think that uh, there's a way to mitigate uh, a steep increase in property taxes for the Ed Fund? Well, I think it, a lot of it depends on what uh, happens in Washington. I know that there was a, an initiative, a move uh, by many on both sides of the aisle to, uh, to help out with the reopenings, with the education portion, uh, whether these funds would be um, be able to be utilized, uh, more flexibility in the CARES Act and so forth, uh, where we might be able to, to use them for some of the, the deficits. So again, we're, we don't know what's going to happen in Washington. We don't know what's going to happen with the virus. And we're at the mercy of both at this point in time. Um, but I think we have to wait and see. Uh, we're okay right now. Um, it's nothing that we have to worry about today. Uh, but uh, we'll know more, I think, once the uh, Congress gets back uh, into session and they work out a deal with the administration and uh, to see whether there's going to be any more dollars flowing into the states and whether those can be used for any uh, deficits as well for uh, the startups for education. It would make a dramatic difference uh, in our budgets. Do you think we'll know that before the legislature uh, no. is done for the year? Oh, I, I have no idea. Um, probably not um, because we don't know you know, the time uh, frame, timetable for the Congress. And if, you, if anyone can tell us that, uh, then that would help us solve the other. I don't even know what the timetable is going to be for the legislature at this point. Yeah, well, if you had that crystal ball, we'd all be uh, a lot better off. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, thank you. Hadley Leskowski, the Valley Reporter. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Levine. Um, you mentioned that on Saturday the FDA authorized the emergency use of a saliva test uh, for COVID-19 and I was wondering when do you think Vermont will be able to add this saliva test to its existing testing protocols and how many peer-reviewed studies do you need to see before actually introducing it as a possibility? Great questions, thank you. Um, We actually, technically speaking, are using it slightly already. There is a saliva test uh, through a company named Vault that the University of Vermont has asked its undergraduate students to submit a sample to before they leave their hometown. So these are mostly out-of-state students. Uh, and it's thus far shown one positive finding, which made one student delay their departure from home uh, because obviously they were, they were positive at that time. So technically you could say Vermont's already using it, but I won't quite go that far. Um, as I mentioned in my comments, the public health lab is going to be um, seeing what kind of literature we can come up with that would support the use of this test. I'm not reporting that we don't want to use this test or don't feel that um, it's going to be a valid test to use. It's really the circumstances under which you use it that, that count. So is it used for screening? Is it used in a uh, sequential way where people are being tested every other day uh, at high frequency? Because we know that it probably will have less sensitivity than some of the tests we're using now. And in a state that has very low prevalence of uh, virus currently, tests that have low sensitivity uh, don't become really effective screening tests. Uh, they're much more effective when things are 
very out of control in a state and there is a high prevalence of virus. So we have to really understand the test more in that context in terms of uh, how it performs but also what circumstances it should be used in uh, and then see if it then fills a niche in our testing strategy that would be useful. I mean, I'm all in favor of a test that doesn't utilize more reagents and more collection uh, swabs and kits because that takes care of two of our anxiety-provoking concerns uh, over time. But that doesn't mean that test can replace everything else we're doing and we have to find out where it fits best. Thank you. Aaron Patanka, BT Digger. Hello. Um, I had some real quick, quick questions about the child care program. First of all, uh, do you need the legislature's approval for this $12 billion? Yes, we will uh, from the Joint Fiscal Committee. Okay. Okay. Um, who do you plan to staff the child care center, particularly the, those remote hubs? Um, will they be like regular child care workers? Certainly, we um, we anticipate uh, having counselors and uh, staff. If if you look at it, we're looking at uh, the way that we designed the budget is that we would have ten counselors uh, per hub uh, with one site director, um, as well as. Um, uh, the way that it would be work if we work with our community partners to identify the sites, to identify bring, um, bringing these up on staffing levels. Obviously, at this, uh, at this point, we're probably going to have to pay a premium in order to bring people in, to bring staff in, as well as maybe even uh, signing bonuses in terms of uh, bringing people in. But uh, that's what we anticipate. Mm -hmm. um, and um, does this only qualify for working parents? Can it also include teachers who have children and they're looking for child care for those kids? This would be for school age children. So if you have a school age child, you would qualify. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Andrew McGregor, the Caledonia Record. Star six to unmute Andrew. Andrew McGregor. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Good morning. Um, uh, this is probably for Secretary Smith. Um, the 73 hubs uh, that you described. Um, have, have you identified the towns where you would like to see them cited? And are these going to be state run or are these going to be created and staffed by local partners and and if if local partners do you know who they will be we don't know who they will be just to give you um, what was the first part of your question because i have an answer for that um wh where uh, the, the 73 hubs so it's, it's a very specific number i'm wondering if you've identified the towns where you'd like them to be located we've identified by county um so four in addison county four in bennington county three in caledonia county about 18 in chittenden county one in Essex County, uh, Franklin County would have seven. I can go through the list here. Um, Grand Isle County would have one, Lamoille County three, Orange County four, Orange uh, Orleans County three, Rutland County seven, Washington County seven, Wyndham County five, and Windsor County six. These are all would be new hubs. We would work with our community partners, Let's Grow Vermont, other uh, community partners out there to identify these areas. Some of them would be an extension of the existing summer programs that we would use that have been ongoing and using some of the staff from those existing summer programs. So all of this is being put together right now. Uh, we'll be working closely with uh, partners. These will not be state employees. Uh, I think that was one of your questions as we move forward. <laughs> Matter of fact, most, uh, and I'm trying to think if there's any, 
uh, but uh, child care workers now are not state employees. And uh, do you envision these hubs being staffed and having a capacity to help administer um, the lessons that kids are supposed to be doing on their remote learning days? Or is this more just making sure kids are safe and fed and taken care of so their parents can work? Right now, this is uh, mostly uh, safe and um, uh, having availability so that parents can work. But that's an option that you bring up if there is the ability of one of these um, centers to uh, make sure that the remote, uh, uh, the remote learning is taking place, that's certainly an option that I won't rule out. So there isn't necessarily gonna be a, a requirement that they be equipped with internet and um, you know, no. technology that kids might need? Well, okay. we, Thank you. There, there will be, there will be, we will, through these grants that we're talking about, um, we will pay for enhancing of broadband if, if broadband needs it uh, as we move forward. But there won't be a requirement that you have to have an educator uh, on board. Okay, thank you. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Star six to unmute, Ed. Okay, we're gonna move on. Jack Thurston, NECN. Thanks, Ethan. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Uh, my question is for Secretary French. Dan, Governor Scott referenced staffing levels as one of the many challenges that school districts would, of course, be facing this fall. I'm hearing from administrators from districts around the state who say that they're concerned about their ability to have enough substitute teachers in the fall because they've told their full-time staffers that they absolutely don't want them coming to school if they're not feeling well. And we all know that that directive comes at a time that many of these existing substitutes that they've had for years don't really want to sub because they're often retirees or they're close to the high risk age level. So my question is, how do you view the situation around subs for the fall? And is there anything the state could do to encourage more people to be willing to serve their communities in this way by you know, raising their hand and saying that we're willing to help keep school districts running? Yeah, I think there, these are great points, and it just once again underscores, um, you know, some of the local challenges that districts need to resolve, and one of the more critical ones will be staff availability. <clears throat> I think it was certainly part of our thinking around um, hybrid instruction that one of the things that hybrid does is it allows uh, districts to have that conversation with their staff. If some staff are not available for in-person, for example, uh, those staff might be available to teach online in a remote environment. So it does provide sort of that flexibility. But I think the first step is I, in my comments earlier in the press conference, uh, districts are in the process of finalizing the reopening plans. That's sort of the first step. I think the next step is to have those conversations with their staff about who's available and who feels more comfortable on remote learning and so forth. Um, certainly intersect that with uh, parent interest in the school board and so forth. Uh, but then we get down to these very real issues of how to staff uh, facilities. And uh, to your point, um, we, as a requirement in our guidance, that all staff and students are required to complete a daily health check. So we'll have an understanding, districts will on a daily basis. Uh, now those are formal series of questions. Uh, so it's, it's, it's more than just, uh, you know, how are you feeling about coming in, but it really identifies, you know, the, those conditions because as we know, many of the symptoms of COVID-19 are very similar to uh, the typical cold and flu symptoms that we would experience at, at this time of year. So I think, you know, to, to just layer that in, we have the, the plans are rolling out, those conversations are having with staff, and we have the guidance of the precautions put in place. Um, but I think, you know, that it's an open question as to uh, how this ultimately will resolve, and I, I think we'll see different patterns around the state. Uh, but I think, you know, the, in terms of recruiting substitute teachers, when that becomes necessary, I think, once again, remote learning adds sort of a different uh, option on the table in that regard, and, and hopefully um, we'll be able to provide additional opportunities for students to access resources when their regular teacher is not available. Thanks, Dan. Leonelder Connors, VPR. Uh, 
Hi, um, a question on the, the child care hub that the state is working to set up. Um, it, you know, it sounds like you, you allocated them a certain amount per county, um, but when it comes to where they're going to be located within those counties, um, what are you going to be doing to make sure that the geographical distribution of them doesn't it, you know, goes to places where where they're needed, and to sort of make sure that um, they're, you're not going to be furthering any act, like inequities to access um, in those communities. I mean, you're, you're talking a lot about how we need to bring students back to try to uh, eliminate some inequities that have grown in the time apart from school. Um, so, just sort of wondering how that uh, ethos is going to be playing into your plan to set up these additional child care facilities. Mike Smith, I just, um, I, I think you've got to look at it this way. We're putting into place a system just like we did when at the height of the pandemic, we're putting in a system uh, that was never done before. Uh, we're doing this now again uh, during the height of the, uh, during this, uh, uh, this situation. And I think you find just like we did at the height of the pandemic, that we worked out those issues, um, first with essential workers, and then as all child care centers came out on June 1st, we're going to try to continue to work on those issues. It isn't a, it isn't a new issue. It is a issue that has been uh, prevalent throughout sort of the, um, not only the pandemic, pre-pandemic in terms of child care distribution, but I think working with the locals, working with our community providers, we will try to make sure that the distribution is, um, meets the needs of that particular county. As you, as you mentioned, I mean, some of these counties are fairly significant. Uh, seven for Rutland County, I think I said, um, as well as uh, Chittenden County uh, at 18, uh, Rutland County at seven. Um, so there are opportunities to spread these out among the, uh, uh, among the communities, and we'll be looking at that as we move forward. But what about uh, in terms of connecting families to those places? I mean, it sounds like it's first come, first serve, but won't that sort of, you know, it, for it, that's not exactly the, the best way to make sure everyone gets access to this in some ways? I mean, is the state going to do any outreach to try to help families that maybe are less likely to be hearing about this or, or students that might be work, work with districts to identify students that might be more in need than other students so those inequities are yeah, we'll further. Be, uh, further. This is not going to be in a vacuum. We're going to be working with the supervisory unions. Obviously, we will be working through our CCFAP um, application process in order to help subsidize some of this this program for those that need it so it's not going to be in a vacuum as we as we move forward nonetheless we have to move quickly to get this system up in in place and uh, and we'll do that we'll do both in terms of reach out in terms of letting people know that's why we're we're, we're discussing it here today uh, and as well as making sure through our district offices um, that this information gets out and working closely with the supervisory unions. And the plan is to have it ready by the day school opens up in three weeks? We're hoping to get it up and running as quick as possible. This is, uh, this is a major undertaking as it was during the height of the pandemic, putting in the essential workers program. Um, I'm not going to put a date on it, um, but at the same time, um, DCF knows that this is a priority and we need to move on this as quickly as possible. Thank you. Mike Donahue, The Islander. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, Governor, uh, we're hearing complaints about the state not investing uh, in roadside mowing and trash pickups uh, along uh, like Interstate 89 and the state's natural beauty is not looking as good as a lot of past summers. Uh, just wondering if there's a reduction in uh, polishing up Vermont due to highway uh, staffing shortages due to COVID or whether it was because the highway people were 
having to monitor. It's a lot, you spent a lot of money monitoring the incoming traffic at the state borders, or is it some other financial reason that they're not getting out there and doing the work? Yeah, I think it, uh, it revolves around financing. Uh, obviously, with the first quarter budget, uh, we, uh, we worked with the legislature on, uh, there were some reductions in maintenance in particular on our state highways and roadside mowing was the first to go. Um, hopefully, um, stay tuned, uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to do um, some more of that uh, because I think that as we work ourselves out of this situation we find ourselves in, uh, that we want to make sure that we're welcoming, that we're clean and, and, um, and we open up the doors to, uh, to those who are traveling in, the tourists and so forth. So uh, at this point in time, again, when you have to weigh out uh, some of the options, um, the legislature decided to uh, to uh, reduce the budget, the maintenance in particular uh, on the uh, on the highways, and roadside mowing was uh, well, was one of the first that had to go. And somewhat interrelated, maybe is uh, the state is spending money and manpower renumbering the exits along the interstate system and erecting a lot of new signs, uh, and so in light of economic time is this a wise investment even if it's federal money it's still tax dollars and how much is it costing the state to 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 renumber the exits how much is it costing local businesses having to redo their signs their websites their placemats and more i mean that seems like the exit numbering system has worked roughly for what 55 years yeah. why why change it that, to, that was that meantime. was yeah that was our argument to the federal government uh, this is an initiative i think new york uh, fought this for as long as they could as well we did uh, we were able to negotiate a, a little bit of an agreement with them uh, where we're not going to have to um, change all of our signage at this point in time this is going to be a transition over the next number of years uh, this is all federal money i believe it's a hundred percent uh, no state dollars uh, if they want it. And we're not doing much of that right now, uh, to be honest with you. Again, this is uh, something that's going to be done over the next number of years. Um, but if the federal government decided to, uh, to take and divert that money uh, to something else that we could uh, actually use, uh, we would be all ears and welcome that opportunity. Is there any effort to ask that that money be diverted for other needy things in Vermont? Well, again, we tried to, we've been working at this for a while and resisted uh, for a number of years. Uh, for the last four years, uh, I've been uh, governor, I've resisted. So um, I didn't think it was uh, uh, for Vermont. It just didn't make a lot of sense. I can't remember the last time that we uh, added an exit, uh, although there's been some proposed. And we may so see some in the future. But, uh, but at this point in time, it just doesn't seem like it uh, it fits Vermont very well. We don't really, you know, as you stated, uh, the system has been working quite well. We know our exits. We know where exit 10 is. We know where exit 16 is, and and they've been uh, staples uh, in the, for the traveling public. So, again, uh, we're not doing anything with that uh, to any great extent at this point in time. So there's probably not a lot of money to uh, to divert back to areas that we need. But uh, any time that we can put money back into uh, paving and infrastructure and replacement of culverts and things of that nature, uh, that's where I would go first. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Joseph Gresser, Barton Chronicle. Hello. I'm not sure to whom this question should be directed. It's about contact tracing and Having heard about experience in other states and not much about what's happening lately, I'm interested in knowing um, how responses from people who have been contacted are going, um, especially with the uh, likelihood that there may be some additional clusters as uh, colleges and universities reopen. I think it's an excellent question for Dr. Levine. Joe, what, what, what was the part of the question towards the end when you were saying uh, the experience in Vermont? Well, I, I, was, I was thinking that um, the 
experience that we're having so far may be relevant um, given the anticipated increase in cases that will come along with um, students returning to the universities and colleges. Great. No, that's great. Um, I'll preface my comments with saying that um, we've had some website material devoted to this on one of our weekly update sets of slides. Um, it, in it, it tells about our rapidity of response in contact tracing and talks about uh, how many cases were, just, were, were interviewed in the first 24 hours versus 48 hours or longer, how many contacts were interviewed in the same time period. And we're doing very, very well in that regard. Um, we're up you know, in the 95 plus percent range for those kinds of metrics, which is great. Um, admittedly, more recently, um, though we're seeing more diversity of cases, we're not seeing uh, the abundance, which is wonderful. Uh, but we have staff in, in the wings waiting when, that, when and if that might happen. The um, recent college returns haven't generated a high number of cases yet either. Uh, but as you know, uh, young people are social. And uh, that may mean there will be more contacts per case than uh, we might be accustomed to from a time when we were all staying at home and had very few contacts. One thing I'm heartened by, and I don't have a precise number to give you, um, when you start reading about other states' experience with contact tracing, you find that at many times they're only able to contact 20 to 35 percent of the uh, original cases uh, within a small period of time. Um, not because they're getting overwhelmed, but because the population they're dealing with may not be as amenable to picking up the phone and discussing things with the uh, health expert on the other end. Um, we're blessed in Vermont to have a population that I think values that interaction and we haven't run into that kind of difficulty. So to summarize, you know, to this point in time, we're able to effectively contact Trace uh, with a very high rate of success uh, in terms of time frame, um, pretty much universally. And um, that's really helped us tremendously as we've managed uh, the, the outbreaks that we've had to manage and the clusters that we've seen. And we have a great compliant population. And we have uh, adequate personnel so that even if with the universities and colleges coming back and the schools reopening, there were more and more cases, uh, we, we feel pretty confident that we're poised uh, for success in that arena. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, I understand Commissioner Harrington is on, on the line. I, be I believe so. I I'll see if I can answer it first, but <laughs> go ahead. No, OK. Uh, I know you earmarked, uh, Governor, about $20 million to meet the $100 uh, supplement to the, the, the president uh, suggested $400 a week. and. Um, but my estimate, that'd be four or five weeks worth of um, uh, those extra payments on the state side. Does that, does that sound right? Yes. Um, that's all, that the, uh, that's all the, uh, the president had put forward, uh, some of the FEMA dollars. Uh, that's as long as it will last, about, uh, about four weeks. So it's a limited amount of time, I think, just as a stopgap measure between what the, uh, the Congress works out with the uh, with the president. And one of the, the questions earlier with the Suzanne Young meeting was how many Vermonters right now are on UI and PUA that would be getting this? Yeah, it, it, there's a certain formula. Anybody over um, $100, uh, it would be getting that uh, those dollars. Um, so it, it wouldn't be much less than the 40,000 uh, that are on the, uh, the PUA and the uh, traditional unemployment at this point in time. 
So if I, so if I just write about 40,000 or, or almost 40,000, that'd be fair enough? I'd say, yeah, it's in that, uh, that range. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, have I got that number right? It's a little over 40,000, but I don't know if we've worked out the numbers as to who would be uh, eligible uh, over $100. Uh, you're correct, Governor. So I think, you know, we're roughly at about uh, 45,000 individuals collecting uh, at any given time, uh, and that includes both UI and PUA. Um, there are two caveats. Uh, one is the $100. They have to be, they have to have a maximum weekly benefit amount of $100 or more to be eligible uh, for the program. They also have to, their separation or their eligibility for unemployment insurance has to be directly related to COVID. Most of them are obviously, but um, there are certain uh, circumstances where someone may have been unemployed even prior to COVID-19 um, that is still collecting benefits, um, or there are other mitigating factors uh, unrelated to COVID. Um, so we are working uh, to pull that information from our mainframe. Um, so there are a couple caveats in there, but it, it will be certainly less than 45,000, um, but I don't think it will be much less uh, when you factor in those, those two requirements. Okay, all right, great, thank you very much. Yep. Kevin McCallum, seven days. Hi, Governor, thanks for taking the call, can you hear me? We can. Governor, my, uh, I think both my questions are for you. The first one is, um, what are your thoughts upon seeing the rhetoric out of uh, the White House about mail-in balloting and funding for the post office? And do you share um, Secretary of State Condos' alarm at those remarks? And if so, what are you what are you doing to make sure that Vermonters' mail-in ballots uh, this fall are? Uh, processed by the post office so they can be counted by the clerk. Yeah, I'm concerned, uh, as is Secretary Condos, I share his concerns. So uh, we're on the same page in that respect. Um, our programs uh, that we have in place, even if we didn't mail a ballot to every, every uh, Vermonter, uh, the, the program we have in place could be impacted. But I was uh, relieved to hear that uh, the, uh, the postal uh, uh, I don't know if it's the postmaster in Vermont, uh, but uh, but they thought uh, that we would be okay uh, here, that we wouldn't be impacted uh, like other states. But I share the concern, and I'm um, grateful uh, that the Congress is going back into action. I think they went in over the weekend uh, to discuss this very topic, and hopefully uh, they will be able to uh, put back into place uh, enough funding so that we don't have an impact on voters throughout the throughout the country because it's it's really important that every vote counts and so we don't want there to be any delay in uh, in doing that but we'll uh, we'll continue to monitor this work with the secretary of state in any way we possibly can to help uh, make sure that uh, there isn't any any type of uh, delay in the action of the of the postal service uh, are you aware of anything that the secretary of state has proposed that might sort of uh ameliorate or, or otherwise adapt to a situation where, you know, the Postal Service's ability to deliver all those ballots is in question? Yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't spoken to him about this, but I've given a little bit of thought. And uh, if we get to that point, you know, where it is looking like we'll have a problem, uh, I would just offer uh, that each and every one of us individually uh, could have an impact by, you know, maybe not mailing uh, anything for the last couple of weeks. Maybe we could reach out to businesses that typically do mailers. Maybe candidates wouldn't do their mailers for the last couple of weeks uh, to make sure that we pave the way, so to speak, uh, for for those to use the system. Um, so if you're, you know, businesses are using it, uh, that could delay uh, some of their uh, postal operations for two weeks. That could have a, a tremendous impact, I think. But I haven't discussed this with the Secretary of State. He's, he's the expert on the elections. I'll leave this in, uh, in his court. But if there's anything we can do to help, uh, obviously, we would want to be able to, to assist in any way we can. OK. And the last question is, you, you put a lot of energy and time uh, uh, as governor into luring people to the state of Vermont um, to try to address the demographic crisis the state faces. Are you doing anything, or is the state doing anything to sort of market 
uh, the state of Vermont and its low COVID rate because we're starting to see evidence of people moving here, uh, working from here. Um, and I'm wondering if you're doing anything to try to capitalize on that um, as you've done in the past and sort of bring people to the state. Yeah, so, suffice, it, suffice it to say that uh, I'm interested in doing something like that, uh, but I don't think it's appropriate right now. Um, um, obviously, this is uh, Vermont is selling itself just by our low positivity rate, uh, low number of cases. Uh, we're a great place to live, uh, work, uh, and recreate. So that in itself is selling um, many uh, from around the region uh, to come to Vermont, as we're seeing in some of the real estate sales. Um, but when it is safe, uh, when we do have a vaccine, when, you know, if I'm still in office at that point, uh, I would guarantee uh, that we will be, again, marketing in some respect, uh, trying to attract more people because we're, after this uh, COVID crisis, uh, uh, you know, comes to fruition uh, and we get back uh, to somewhat normal, uh, normal means we have a demographic crisis on our hands. Uh, and it's something that we have to solve. It's going to be uh, there when, uh, when this is over. So I will have an interest in, in trying to capitalize on this uh, if possible, but right now uh, we have to uh, uh, to make sure that we maintain the safety of Vermonters, and and I don't th I think it's premature for us to go out and uh, try and promote uh, and bring people into the state in in too many uh, respects. Okay, thanks very much. Libby Farrow, local 22, local 44. Are you guys able to hear me? We can. Perfect. Uh, so the question is really for, but I know you guys mentioned an app, an app was regarding, you know, I was wondering if the app is going to regard checking symptoms of people, you know, going into the schools and whatnot, or what is this app entirely going to entail? Yeah, Secretary French. Uh, thank you. Um, in our health guidance, there's a requirement that schools uh, implement a daily health check for students and staff, and that health check includes answering a series of questions. Many of you might be familiar with, you know, do you have symptoms? Have you been in close contact with someone with COVID-19 symptoms, so forth? And the second component is a temperature check, which would be administered by school personnel. Um, so we're looking at a technology a solution, an app, if you will, to uh, help automate some of that uh, process because otherwise it can be quite burdensome. Perfect. Um, I think you answered my question. Thank you. Well, Guy Page. Governor, you've been extending the state of emergency month by month. But you have also suggested on occasion that restrictions may remain until Vermonters are vaccinated or something else ends the pandemic nationally. Uh, are you ready to say today, uh, will Vermont be under a state of emergency until there's a vaccine? And if so, when that time comes, are you and other state leaders ready to give up the exercise of all the state of emergency powers? Um. Yeah, I'm not ready to commit to that at this point. I just don't know how, you know, we'll have to maintain and watch this, uh, the, the virus and, and see where it brings us. Um, there are other approaches. Uh, there could be a, a point in time uh, when we could, uh, we could uh, cease uh, the, the executive order, or the emergency order, uh, and do something through legislative action, for instance. Uh, so that doesn't preclude us from doing that, uh, and we'll just have to wait and see. Now, now is not the time. Uh, we need the, uh, the emergency order as a, as a vehicle to, to both add uh, protection and uh, to open up uh, businesses and so forth. Um, so we're not at a point where I believe that uh, the other solution, uh, working with uh, the legislators and, and putting into uh, to law, uh, so to speak, uh, some of the actions that could, could take place. But, um, but we're not at that point at this point. Okay. Um, and as to the other part of my question, uh, when the time comes, are, are you and do you think other state leaders ready to kind of give up the exercise of the sort of rather extraordinary powers that you've been exercising during the state of emergency? Um, well, when we, when we don't extend the executive order, that will be giving them up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm just wondering, though, I mean, if you, you've had months of, of uh, 
having sort of more, more influence and more say than you normally have. And people sort of wonder, are they getting kind of used to this? Or is it, no, we're really ready to... Yeah. No, I, I can. I can say I'm, I'm looking forward to things getting back to normal, uh, and that would be to release the powers that I have under the executive order. It's not something I take lightly, uh, but it's not something that uh, that I look forward to either. Uh, I think, uh, again, we've used it appropriately uh, for, and as uh, as we've seen with our low case numbers, and uh, where we're at, uh, being the lowest. Uh, uh, lowest positivity rate in the in the country. Obviously, we're doing something right, uh, but uh, but I'm I'm ready uh, anytime that we can get to a place where we don't have to have the executive order. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to that date. Thank you, Mike Bielowski. Uh, hi, can you hear me all right? We can. Okay. Great. Uh, similar question, sorry. Um, so thanks for taking my question, Mike, with True North Report. Uh, so last week you extended the state of emergency for another month. There has been two, death, two more deaths in the past month, still just a few hospitalizations per day. Uh, since the beginning, there's only been 13 deaths in all of Vermont under the age of 70. So my question is, can you describe for Vermonters the specific scenario that you are waiting for before we can go back to our normal lives. Yeah, I think we have to see as a country uh, where we stand. You know, we're so mobile in this country uh, and, and truly as a, as a region. As I pointed out, I'm, I'm sure you were watching last Friday when we did our modeling, uh, we saw the number of red counties increase uh, in the Northeast, meaning uh, this is migrating towards us. That's why I took some of the action I did about three or four weeks ago. So. Um, I don't know, um, again, uh, when the right time is, but I can tell you it's not while the, the virus is heading towards us. That is not the right time okay. uh, to release. I would say when the region is uh, getting more green, uh, that there is more uh, throughout our country, but particularly in the Northeast, uh, that, would be, that would probably be more appropriate. But, you know, it's still very, yeah. it's volatile. I mean, look how quick. Uh, we, for instance, um, Hawaii was the, had the lowest number of cases uh, in the United States uh, by far. This was like five, six weeks ago, um, lower than Vermont, and uh, and then uh, their cases started to grow. Uh, right now, uh, they have four times the number of cases they did five five uh, weeks ago. So they obviously uh, have a problem. I don't want Vermont to be the next one with a problem. So we'll continue to, to monitor um, and uh, we'll do what we can to protect Vermont. But when you have high population areas uh, just to the north of us, uh, you know, if the border were to open up, uh, Montreal there, Quebec City um, and Toronto, uh, as well in uh, New York, uh, New York City and Boston, we've seen in New Jersey. I mean, those New York and New Jersey uh, combined have about I would say, uh, you know, they had 50,000 deaths. So we, we have to pay attention to the region. It's not just about Vermont. And, and I think uh, it's uh, us, using tunnel vision to just look at Vermont um, in, in isolation. Um, are you watching the death rate for all these cases? Yeah, is, we always hear a lot about cases, but the death rate, the death percentage remains very low, especially under age 70. I think it's 0 0.04 percent for the nation under age 70. Uh, are, are you watching those numbers as well? Well, obviously we watch. Or I watch uh, the death rates as well. I mean, again, 32,000 in New York alone. Um, um, uh -huh. Certainly, um, I mean, even even our neighbors uh, to to our east in New Hampshire have um, uh, over 400 uh, deaths. So. If you, you know, every death is meaningful. Um, and uh, the 58 deaths in Vermont uh, are something that I think about every day. So I don't want there to be 59. I don't want there to be 60. And, and I'm, I'm sure you don't want a family member to be one of those numbers either. Uh, are, are we watching how many of these deaths have uh, comor comorbidities or comorbidities? I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Because uh, I, I heard that number is often pretty high, speaking of having an older population. You've got a lot of people passing away, I think, with other conditions that were serious. 
Um, I, do you have a response I, to that, or is that something I, that? No, I, I, yeah, no, nothing that I can add to that. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Yep. S Steve Merrill. Can you hear me? Can. Great. Uh, I have one for the governor and, and one for the doctor, if I may. Uh, governor, again, um, uh, going back to the emergency powers, and, and we still have you, a... You guys uh, all have governor. breakfast together this morning? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, somebody whizzed in the cornflakes, I think. The, um, the, 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 uh, we still haven't got a handle on how many, uh, or, or a number for, how many older folks we lose by attrition um, just naturally, I've asked. Uh, I've asked about these numbers, and we haven't, you know, we haven't um, seen what they are. I mean, obviously, nobody wants to die, and everybody wants to live forever. But no, I, uh, I, 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 I don't, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, okay, I'll give you that. Uh, but uh, what specific what specific powers do you need with a state of emergency? Isn't the isn't the uh, the health commissioner uh, given extraordinary powers over public health um, just through his office? Uh, anyway, sure. But I think uh, in in this respect, we're be, we've been able to uh, deal with the with the economy, uh, deal with the reopenings, closures, and so forth. I think uh, I think we've used them judiciously. Um, and, uh, and again, I have to say, I don't take it lightly. Uh, it's not something that I relish to have the power to shut down uh, a business in particular uh, and uh, alter the lives of Vermonters in any respect. So I've, um, I, each and every decision that we make, um, I have to reflect, but I use the guidance, uh, the data, the science, and, and the experts, uh, Dr. Levine, Dr. Kelso, in arriving at decisions uh, that I think are, are helpful to Vermont and to mitigate uh, the, uh, the effects of, uh, of the virus on Vermont. And again, I have to say with our numbers, we've been effective, uh, especially when you consider that we're just, you know, a two, two three hour drive from, from, uh, from Boston, uh, three to four or five hour drive, depending on where you are, to New York City. Uh, and what they had to go through, we didn't experience that. And I think it was all reflective of uh, some of the actions that we took in many, most other governors. I, I, I don't know if there's another state that didn't uh, use their emergency powers on this. Uh, yeah, the, the, it's a point of debate. Um, I have a mass question for Dr. Levine, if I may. Dr. Levine. Yes, please. Um, hi, Doc. Uh, I have a question from one of my viewers about masks and, uh, and, and the mask mandate. Uh, I, we're, we're seeing that some states or uh, municipalities that are mandating masks are um, mandating that they not uh, that they not use the ones with uh, the flapper valves in them. Uh, that it be a, a, a facial covering mask. And uh, I had a viewer ask me uh, about uh, the mask. Is it, isn't it only an N95 mask that you shouldn't touch uh, with your hands while in use, uh, and that you should only wear for 12 hours or something like that and dispose of? Isn't the only true protection provided by an N95 mask and they consider the, uh, the, the, the other type of mask to be like a kabuki mask theater or something? Yeah, let me, let me go into that in a little more detail. Um, thank you again for recognizing my special powers, uh, but they certainly, <laughs> they certainly don't uh, rise to the level of the governors. And uh, you have to be in pretty dire straits for any powers I have to be exercised. So you asked a bunch of questions at once, so I'll try to clarify. Um, the N95 is the most effective mask in the area of filtration. So when you look at particle sizes that are very small numbers of microns, micron being, as you can Such imagine, quite small, the N95. Such as the virus. What's that? Such as the virus. 
such as the virus, exactly, um, they will filter out 95% of uh, all particles down to a certain small number of microns. The typical surgical mask, which I'm holding in my hand now, um, is not as effective as N95, but does filter out a high percentage of particles as well. The cloth facial covering filters out the lowest amount, but still probably 20, 30 um, percent. And, um, and that's fine because the major goal of the masks right now is to protect, protect others from the larger respiratory droplets that we all could spray on. The N95 has a model that comes with this exhalation valve. That would defeat the purpose of what we're using it for in this pandemic, so we don't recommend anyone invest in one of those. The news uh, a week or two ago was about the gator uh, type of masks. And uh, that was one study with uh, one set of investigators uh, that, frankly, if they had stuck with the data that they generated, uh, there'd be much less controversy now because the data they generated made one question whether those were as effective as facial coverings, um, but also, they took it to a level in the uh, discussion with the media that perhaps it was actually worse than having no mask on at all because there were uh, pores in the uh, material, especially if it was a single layer, that uh, allowed more droplets to uh, spread around. Most people don't believe that's true at this point, especially if you have one that has more than one layer of cloth. And like so many things with this pandemic, one study that comes along doesn't trash every other study that's ever been done. In the scientific world, we basically look for people to um, confirm findings or, or refute them, but find some pattern. Uh, and one very small study um, that uh, had a few off-the-cuff comments made about it, as opposed to actually focusing on the data, uh, wouldn't be enough to say, don't use those kinds of masks either. Did I answer? So would you not rec would, Yes. Would, so, but would you not recommend the flapper valves in any instance? Not during this pandemic. All right, great. Um, well, thank you both very much. Avery Powell, WCAX. My question is likely for Secretary French. Where is the um, agency of education on guidelines for physical education classes within schools? We haven't produced specific guidance on physical education, although in our health guidance it does speak to the use of common areas uh, such as gyms and cafeterias and so forth. Um, I understand there is a conversation going on uh, with physical education teachers. They have an interest in seeing specific guidance developed. We've had similar conversations with music teachers and so forth. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's kind of where we are back to uh, this idea that now we're focused on the how of implementing the health guidance. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to work uh, with content experts, uh, teacher groups, and so forth if they feel they need specific guidance to implement our, our health guidance. So you don't, there's not going to be a specific guidance on physical education coming out? Uh, I'm not sure yet. Uh, I know we're having those conversations at a certain level in the agency with physical education teachers. Thank you. Well, April Barton, Burlington Free Press. Hi, my question is for Secretary Smith, and it's also about the child care hub. Um, my question is, you said that money would be provided for startup and operational costs. Now, would parents also pay for these spots, or would it be a free service, or would there be some sort of pay structure, like 50%, like we saw in child care spots this summer? How, how would those spots be paid for? Let me answer that a couple of ways. Um, sites would be able to charge uh, families tuition for the care provided. 
Uh, the hub grants okay. that we talked about are intended to provide startup funding for the site. So operational cost, facility cost, those sort of things. Families needing assistance, um, paying for childcare, can apply, for, and I said this a, a little while before, for the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. It's called CCFAP. And CCFAP pays tuition on behalf of eligible families directly to programs in support of their child care needs. And it's, it's a sliding scale need based upon your needs. So all of those sort of come into play, all the, all the things that you mentioned come into play in how this all integrates together. Okay, thank you very much. Cliff Cooper, North Avenue News. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Governor. Uh, just a question on the uh, primary and the uh, very important November election. Um, during the primary, we had a record turnout of like 175,000 voters. The question is that um, when you looked at the invalid ballots, there were 6,000 uh, ballots that were marked as invalid, which ends up being about 4% of the electric. Uh, that's almost the size of every woman child in St. Johnsbury for the amount of people that were knocked out of the races. How do you feel about that going into the November elections? Well, obviously it's a, a concern. I know um, the Secretary of State is looking into that to, to find out what the common denominator is. I would, I would anticipate it was probably due to the three ballots that are sent during a primary. Uh, that may, does make it a little more complicated because you can't use all three. Not everyone understands that. You had to put them in the separate envelopes and then return them all together in the same envelope. So it got a little complicated. Uh, whereas with the general election, there'll be a, just one ballot. Uh, so that will be a, a bit different. Um, so we'll see what the uh, Secretary of State uh, finds out in his investigation. Um, he's the expert on elections, so I'll just I'll leave that to him. Yeah, and on a personal note, I I was questioned whether I signed. I did mail in a ballot myself and my wife, and and um, I didn't know whether I actually signed the outside of the envelope. So I did go to the polling place and double check to see if we were actually registered, and we did vote, and it was passed. But my concern of the primary is that in the state race for Senate, there's six votes for the people to get involved in the Democratic side of it. And the sixth and the seventh person in this primary were only off by 46 votes. So those 6,000 being in that group of invalid ballots might have a turnout of a different person for that spot. So to speak. Yeah, I think your, your point is well taken. I think there were some other uh, close races throughout Vermont and, and could have had a difference on the outcome. So it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. I'm sure that they will uh, take the ballots that were uh, deemed uh, not acceptable and probably look through them, I would imagine. But again, probably a better question for this uh, Secretary Condos. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Yep. That's it. That's it. All right, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Friday, and we'll talk about uh, modeling then. Thank you.